Good afternoon, everyone. You don't really need to know who's eating your lunch. A much more interesting question would be how they're eating your lunch. So are they doing something slightly differently, something that you might be able to copy or better? A few months ago, I joined Carwell to, uh, as, as UK MD. And you may know us as, uh, for our enormous audience, we have the biggest YouTube uh, automotive channel in the world. Or you may know us as Europe's biggest uh, new car marketplace. But over the last 18 months, we've actually been really expanding our portfolio of products. So we've recently added used cars. We now have used cars on the platform as well. And in 2021, we added our stock sourcing uh, products. Uh, which we've been rapidly scaling uh, over the last 18 months or so. We're on a mission to be a one-stop shop for drivers who are looking to change their cars. So helping them to do everything from finding those cars to getting the cars, driving them, and then ultimately selling them again. And of course, so as a marketplace, we want to connect all of those customers that we've aggregated together um, and connect them to you the right cars, the right partners, we effectively want to serve you your lunch. Now, I've spent the vast majority of my career helping businesses to transition online. I was at The Guardian when they were trying to figure out how to get customers to read the news online. And then I was at The Times when we were trying to figure out how to get people to pay for news online. I was at Sky when they were trying to figure out uh, what to do about people watching TV, but not on TV. And I've helped all sorts of different retail businesses figure out how to sell physical things in a digital world. So when I got to Carwell, and I'm new to the industry, I started trying to figure out and understand uh, the auto trade a bit better. And I started by talking to our commercial teams. And our commercial teams have hundreds of thousands of conversations every year with partners and businesses just like yours. And I asked them what they were seeing, what trends they were observing in the market, what best practice looks like, and about the kind of advice that they, they were giving to, to our partners. And then, because we're a marketplace, and so we can see both sides, I also spoke to our excellent customer research team about what they were learning. And they, they get tens of thousands of pieces of feedback from, from customers every year. And I asked them, uh, I asked them what, they were, they, what they were hearing from, from buyers and sellers. And here's what I learned. I learned that you are building digital businesses. Whether you always talk about it like that or not, you're building digital businesses. Consumer behavior has been shifting. Where people used to walk into five showrooms before they bought a car, they now walk into less than two. And then GDPR came along and wiped out 60% of your customer databases. And suddenly, it's become a lot harder to generate those pools of prospect customers for, for um, uh, car buyers. The research phase for car buying has been shifting online uh, for many years, as you know, but it's been pretty gradual until COVID came along and accelerated the hell out of it over the last few years. And so customers suddenly went from using websites as sort of brochureware, looking at photographs, being able to see information about vehicles, to being able to do a 360 walk around of a vehicle. And of course, they got very quickly got used to click and collect as well. And like a lot of retail sectors before you, you're chasing this consumer behavior. You're following customers online. And a really significant portion of how you do your business now, where you find your customers, how you talk to them, and, and how you manage them is now online, in these digital showrooms. You are building digital businesses. Now, let me tell you a little bit about why I have spent my career getting very excited about building digital businesses. And it's this. Customers don't make decisions in uh, a linear, a neat linear way. They, they never have. The thing that we get with digital, though, is we get the ability to see that decision making and the chance to intercept it. Our customers, car wash customers, tend to take five months from the first time they touch our site, so either reading an article or watching one of our YouTube videos, all the way through to that decision to purchase. Five months. 
That is almost as long as you'd be waiting for a new Defender at the moment. Of course, if you want a second-hand one, we've got one being sold on our site today, so do pop around there and take a look. But five months, so what, right? But, well, the so what is that during those five months, most shoppers are, really don't know what they want. In fact, three quarters of them are open to suggestion. They're open to suggestion, they're open to persuasion, and they are open to conquesting. And they're open to persuasion on pretty much everything. Ownership models, finance models, makes and models, and of course, new versus used. So here's an example, uh, a real customer example from our website earlier this year. Now, obviously that is not her name, and I'm pretty sure that's not a picture of Davina, but this is a genuine customer journey. And we've probably picked Davina up a little way into her, into her purchase decision making. So she's probably watched a few of Matt Watson's videos, or she's been on some review content, and so she, she's a little way in. And off she goes, and she starts configuring vehicles. And she starts with the Tesla, and then she's onto a BMW, a Nero, the 3 Series, and on she goes from there. And just look at that jumping around between different brands and, and, and makes and models, until eventually, almost six weeks later, she purchases that XC40. And then the interesting thing is she then comes back again after that purchase to configure a few more vehicles. Customers will spend an average of nine hours on our site before they make a purchase. And then as I just mentioned there, just as Davina did, they will come back again and reconfigure additional vehicles after they've purchased. The average car wow consumer configures 32 different configurations across nine models, five different brands, before they contact three different dealers to make that one purchase. That is a lot. And what we then see is with EV buyers, where there's a little bit more confusion and a, a bit more um, uh, volatility between the brands, we see those numbers go up even more. So we see customers exploring even more models and makes and brands as, as they make their decisions. And this is the massive opportunity that, that digital brings, the opportunity to connect with customers so much earlier in their decision making and turning them into your customers. Let's look at this in a slightly different way. So this is a very typical uh, way of illustrating a, uh, a conversion journey, a digital conversion journey from intent through to purchase. And of course, that bit at the bottom, you know very well, that is someone walking into a showroom, they have relatively high intent, they pretty much know what they want, and you are the masters at converting them and, and close, closing out that sale. But this bit at the top is the bit that's different. This is the battle. This is the battleground now. This is where customers are being, uh, are, are being conquested. This is where the lunch is being eaten. And this bit is different because these are literally butts on sofas. And, and, and this bit is all pretty much digital now. You are building digital businesses. The good news is that it's relatively easy to build a digital business. You only have to do two things, but you do have to do them incredibly well. The first of those is that you need to find an audience, and you need to do that really cost effectively. And then the second thing that you need to do is to be able to nurture that audience all the way through from the top, from awareness, all the way through to sale. So let's start with finding an audience. Where can you go to find vast pools of customers who are in market for, for researching and forming, forming their decisions? Well, Google, yes, of course, but cha-ching, cha-ching. If you've got a lot of money, you're, you know, you're well-placed to spend that money with Google. You can do well to find very high-intent customers with Google. You can obviously also build out your own audience by investing. But by far the most cost-effective way to find an in-market audience of car shoppers is to use a marketplace. Now, of course, I would say that because I work for a marketplace. But if you look across any other kind of core retail sector that's transitioned online, what you find at the heart of those markets is a marketplace that has got really good at aggregating customers who are trying to make decisions and connecting them with suppliers who want to talk to them. 
Marketplaces save customers time, they save them money, but they also really support their decision making. And they've become enough of a destination that they're a really cost effective way for suppliers to, to reach those audiences. That said, a lot of suppliers still see marketplaces as the bargain basement of the internet. They still think of it as the place that people will go to get the lowest possible price they can and to kind of beat down on discounting. In my last role, uh, I worked for GoCompare, which many of you will be familiar with. It was one of the first price comparison websites. And it was actually founded on exactly that principle, that customers just compare on price. Uh, and that's all they really care about is how much they pay. But we've proven this time and time again that customer decision making is much broader than that. Price is just one of the factors. So even Go Compare has transitioned away from talking about itself very actively as just being about, about price. And what we found was that at Go Compare, the decision recipe that a customer was going through in their mind was number one, brand, the insurance brand. Then they would look at what the add-ons were, the value in that package. And then they would look at price. So that was the decision recipe for a price comparison website is, um, uh, is brand plus add-ons plus price. Now, in car marketplaces, we're seeing exactly the same thing, that customers are not making their decisions based entirely on price. We have seen over the last two years, using our data at CarWow, this uh, rapid decline in discounting across all of our, our retailer groups. And of course, we expect this to continue as, um, as, agency, as the agency model comes into effect and brands take control, uh, a stronger control of, of their pricing over the next few years. And so where previously customers would have come to a car marketplace with a very, very specific make, model, engine, trim, color, et cetera, in mind and just look for a price, what we're seeing from our customers is that the decision making is very different. And the reason that they're coming to car marketplaces has really shifted. It's evolved in the same way that price comparison or insurance comparison uh, websites have. And these, this is what they tell us that they get from our marketplaces is that confidence in their decision making. And you saw that uh, with that Davina example. Do you remember she bought her XC40 and then she came back and configured two different brands. And she's getting there not just confidence on price, a little bit less of that, but actually confidence that she made the right decision about the vehicle that, that she purchased. On car marketplaces, the decision recipe for customers is reputation, location, and price. This, you'll see that the math doesn't quite add up on this because of the way we ask the question. It is, of course, a multiple of, of these factors that influence, um, that influence customer decision making. But you can look at that and you can see immediately the role that reputation um, uh, and reviews plays in helping customers to make decisions about where and what car they want to buy and where they want to, want to buy it from. Marketplaces are, by their very nature, competitive. And so suppliers who perform well on marketplaces understand that equation and know how to work it and actively try to work it. So the second thing uh, I've talked about, so that's the first thing, is finding an audience and, and, and getting cost-effective access to, to that audience when you're growing a digital business. The second thing that you need to do to grow a digital business is that you need to nurture that audience. Someone in a digital showroom is not as far down that decision-making process as someone who walks into a physical showroom. They're still really indecisive, and they're still making up their minds about what they want. And if you're connecting with someone at the beginning of that five-month decision-making process, you've got a long way to go. And you're going to need to keep that person warm and engaged and interested all the way through that. They're not low quality leads, they are very uh, hot opportunities. So something as simple as starting the conversation with one of these leads by focusing on where they are in that decision making process and establishing what their needs are, we can see from our data that those types of conversations increase conversion by around 20%. It's becoming less about closing sales really quickly and a lot more about the experience and product knowledge. The role of the dealer has shifted from being one of 
to being one of an educator. Anyone who's not bought a car in the last three to five years, everything's changed. Some of these customers don't even know what to ask or what they should be asking for. And the retailers that we see getting more than their fair share are the ones who are adapting to nurturing these leads in a different way. They're accepting that it's a longer game, and they're managing those customer conversations much more consciously. We're even seeing some dealers start to incentivize their teams differently, so focusing reward on customer experience and, um, uh, and customer feedback rather than just purely on sales targets. But it's also, it's not just about what you're saying, but also how you're saying it. Remember, these butts are on sofas, and the vast majority of them are on their mobile phones. So every single message that they are getting on that device is instant, it's personal, and it is uh, short and brief. And yet we quite often see responses to inquiries that look a little bit like this, or potentially even worse, a little bit like this. <laughs> and these are actually genuine messages that we have pulled off our platform and have anonymized them, obviously, for the purposes of today. But, but we do see, we see the struggle. And at Kawa, we, we worry about this a lot. We, we can see that dealers don't always know what the right response is to a question or an approach from a customer. And we can also see that it's not always going to be obvious how that one interaction or that one message impacts the flow through of the conversation uh, and ultimately an outcome to, to a sale. But luckily at Kawa, we have a ton of data. We have over 20 million messages that flow between dealers and, and, and our, our customers every year. And so what we do with that data is we feed it into a conversational data intelligence platform called Reinfer, who we partner with. And we use that platform to use AI and neuro-linguistic programming to look at the quality of those conversations and to connect them back to, to sales outcomes. And what we found from that are some really interesting behaviors and indicators that are transformative in terms of that ultimate goal of, of, of getting the sale. So for example, just coming back to that point on mobile, we've been able to see that shorter, more personal messages on mobile increase conversion by around 25%, which is an extraordinary number uh, to be able to grab hold of just by changing some of your behavior. These customers want to have a conversation, but they want to have it digitally. And we can see that play through as we see conversations developing. And the longer these conversations go on for, the more messages that are exchanged and the more interactions take place, the higher those, conver the, those conversations are likely to, uh, to convert into a sale. Speed is critical. The faster that you can get back to an inquiry, the bigger the impact of that. And some of our highest performing dealer groups who consistently respond in under uh, 30 minutes see up to 40% conversion from inquiry to sale, which again is an extraordinary performance, but is driven, that is significantly driven by, them, by how quickly they're able to respond uh, uh, to, the, to these inquiries. It also has to be personal. It's a human interaction that just happens to be in a digital channel. And we see that kind of playing through in things like if there's a very human response to something. So for example, where we see an apology for a late reply, or we see someone saying, I'm so sorry that I, I missed that message that you put out there. These, these types of apologies drive a 40% uh, likelihood of that conversation being reinvigorated just by being, uh, just by being a little bit more human. And of course, that plays to and through into other areas that you would expect as well. So transparency on stock shortages and kind of being really clear with customers um, how, the, how the sales process is going to, going to unfold. And then tiny little tweaks, like including a customer's name, uh, the make or model that they inquired on, or um, uh, referencing a need that, they, that they've told you about previously in, in some of these early messages has a significant impact as well. As you would expect, templating has the 
has the opposite effect. So where we see kind of templated responses right up front, we, we don't see those working. And I think probably the one that really stood out most for me is kind of really counterintuitively uh, those automated um, campaigns, when they come too early at the start of a conversation, they are really off-putting for, for digital customers who are looking for that, that personal touch and the start of a conversation. All of this takes a lot of practice uh, to get right. And as you know, many of the top performing groups have been uh, now run specialist digital teams who are set up specifically to, to handle these digital leads uh, and to feed those inquiries into their network. And we can see from our data that this is really working. The impact is coming from these teams' ability to uh, handle different kinds of customers who are at different points in their decision making and to be able to really adapt how they're responding to those customers. We can see them uh, getting a lot of impact from cross-selling across different brands and models. And we can also see them really effectively transitioning a customer from this digital showroom into the physical showroom. They are also, these specialist digital teams, spending a lot of time and energy monitoring how they're performing. And they're using data uh, to do that constantly optimizing based on, on the outcomes that they're seeing. It probably won't have escaped you that I've used the word data at least 30 times in the last 20 minutes or so. And when I said at the beginning that there were two things that you needed to do to build a successful digital business, finding and accessing an audience at a cost, in a cost-effective way, and then nurturing that audience through their decision-making, that wasn't entirely true because you can't do both of those things without using data. And so the third thing that you really, really have to get right is data. And I think it's been interesting today walking around the show and seeing how many different businesses there are talking about exactly this problem and how to tackle it. At the heart of every successful digital business is data. And for We've talked a little bit about uh, consumer behavioral data. We've talked about the data that, um, uh, that, you, that we gather from the teams and their interactions. And of course, those types of data are really just the iceberg, tip of the iceberg, in terms of what data you can gather from, from, from digital trading and from gathering a digital audience. And marketplaces like ours gather so much consumer and partner data that we can pretty much see anything. We can see who's conquesting from who. We can see how uh, the effects of a price change is flowing through, uh, right through the conversion funnel. As I said, we can see changes that you're making on your response handling and what the impact is being on your overall conversion. And of course, over the last 12 months, we've been very clearly able to see what the impact of the chip shortage has been on, on brand share uh, and, and consumer appetite. And as a marketplace, we can see all of this. But we can't do anything with it. And arguably, we don't want to. That's your job. Like a good lunch, data is less about quantity and more about quality and how you consume it. The key thing with data is the difference between being data-driven versus data-led. Data-driven businesses gather tons and tons of data, and they use that data to make their decisions for them, to effectively drive their business off the back of the data. But data-led businesses create a foundation for data, and they overlay their own experience and instinct and intelligence on top of that. I've talked a lot about the kind of uh, selling side of your businesses. I'm just going to jump across for this example to the buying side, because I mentioned we launched our stock buying product about uh, 18 months ago now, and we've been building up our data sets in there. But also because on the buying side, this is one of the areas where we see real differentiation at the moment in terms of partner performance and how uh, they are using data in, in different ways. And what we find is that, you know, obviously most, most stock buyers are working on very common data sources, cap, cap uh, auto trader data, etc. Um, and then they're overlaying their own sales data and what they understand about, about their areas on top of that. But they, they're buying sort of straight off that, that price point. 
Whereas some of our other partners we see who are operating in a really data-led way are overlaying all of that data that they've got with their own instincts and experience. And so, for example, they might be looking at where they're anticipating uh, gaps in new, new supply on particular brands and models, and they would then be mapping that against what they know will be a spike in intent uh, on use, and they're using that uh, to effectively get ahead of the data that they have in front of them. Businesses that are data-led are the ones that are going to win in this new digital showroom. As our industry continues to evolve and our customers' behavior continues to shift, the ones who can complement their own experience, expertise, and use data with data to go, both go and find that audience cost-effectively and nurture it all the way through the decision-making process are the ones that are not going to go hungry. Thank you. I think, I think we have time for a few questions, uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions. But otherwise, I would hugely encourage you to uh, come along to the Carwell stand. You can't miss it. We've got a Land Rover Defender in the middle of it and some amazing cupcakes. And have a chat to uh, our teams who, who are all there and would love to, would love to meet you.